Welcome to this emergency podcast that affects the SAP community. I've always wanted to do an emergency podcast. This has been like a fantasy of mine for a long time. And I now like I get to low, do it. I like your low voice in that. Jim. Now I get to do this. And it's I've I've got Josh Greenbaum. Hi, Josh. This is only a test. And Hi. I've got, yes, indeed, the emergency SAP contextual what? analysis okay. system. Yeah. Yes. And I've got Jeff Scott, CEO ASA. Jeff, how's it going? <laughs> John is doing I'm good doing good thank you. I'm 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 absorbing this emergency podcast. <laughs> the purpose of this podcast it's it's kind of a slow cook emergency because this all dates back to some major developments that happened as a result of an earnings call this summer with Christian Klein and subsequent messaging from SAP. We're going to cover it on this podcast today. We're going to try to make sense of it as best we can. The main topics on the table have to do with rise and grow and SAP innovation, the future of that. And then we're, the future of AI and the role of customers and all of that. We're also going to briefly discuss the lean IX acquisition because it just happened and it would be really silly if we didn't at least touch on our initial reaction to that. So, uh, and what I'm really, really glad to have these guys here because spent a lot of time thinking about what this means for customers, right? And and the user groups had immediate reaction to these announcements. And so it's really good to be able to not only offer our views on this, but really think hard about what this means for customers. So let's do this. So uh, I want to go back in time a little bit and just frame this in terms of what happened. So on the July 20th, 2023 uh, quarterly earnings call for Q2, Kristen Klein made some comments that represented a little bit of a shift in how SAP is positioning a lot of topics. Uh, one of them was access to innovation through rise and grow. And he said, it's also very important to emphasize SAP's newest innovations and capabilities will only be delivered in SAP public cloud and SAP private cloud using rise with SAP as the enabler. This is how we'll deliver these innovations and our innovations will not be available to on-premise or hosted on-premise ERP customers on hyperscalers. I think it's pretty obvious why there was a very strong reaction to that statement. And one thing I want to kind of immediately clarify is that access to innovations is probably broader than what Christian intended, because there are still a lot of innovations in the S4 HANA suite and there are also innovations around AI, for example, that are available in various capacities. And this innovations language, as far as I can tell, and Josh and Jeff, you tell me if you agree from what you can tell so far, pertains specifically to generative AI and so-called green ledger cloud-based sustainability stuff, which is viewed as this special form of innovation that's going to be available within the rise offering as a premium offering. So that's my understanding. And they probably SAP probably could have saved itself a little bit of pain with some clarity around that. But anyhow, does that, is that basically how you understand it too? Take it away. You know, I, John, I think you're right, but I agree with you that I don't think they were very specific on what the word innovation means. And so I think we can interpret that a lot of different ways. And, and the risk with that is maybe they do change their mind and maybe innovation is far broader than what they're suggesting um, because there weren't a lot of details about exactly what it was they were talking about. And so you know, one of the worries I have for the customer community is if they can't be specific, how do we know exactly what is included in that and what isn't? And I certainly hope that they're not referencing all innovation, Right, because I think that's a much bigger deal for customers. So I'm hoping it's that narrower scope that you that you talked about. But I think innovation is in the eye of the customer, not necessarily uh, in the eye of SAP. Indeed, and and I will say that unfortunately and cynically, surprisingly, <laughs> not, you know that one of the operative definitions of this kind of innovation is that we're going to charge you more for it. Uh, it's not coming yeah. with, with maintenance. Um, and and you know this is my. My problem, and it, it's sort of extraordinary that we're doing this because I rarely listen to these calls live. I usually just get a transcript and kind of pour over them. I'm going to be listening to this one live. And as he's making this and several of the other stuff, the statements we're, we're going to now talk about, I'm, I actually texted the, you know, the global head of communications and I said, what is he saying? <laughs> this doesn't, this is, doesn't sound good. Um, it's sounding 
amb, you know, ambiguous, it's sounding inflammatory to a certain extent. And and what I in, in retrospect, what I realized is, you know, it's he is talking the language that Wall Street wants to hear him use. He's he sort of code switched there for Wall Street and used that kind of terminology because Wall Street doesn't care about the details. Wall Street doesn't care what innovation is as long as there's a revenue target and, a, and an earnings per share target and a and then, you know, the share target uh, that's being met, they don't really care. So I think I think part of it was the language he used at the time wasn't intended for customers. Uh, unfortunately, customers listen to these things too. But right, uh, but so so I remember that day because you texted me, and and I was really oh, real I was time. I was really you texted me in real time, and I was like. You're like, are you listening to this earnings call? And I'm like, I'll catch a transcript later. Josh, can I get on with my day? And, and then, and <laughs> then, you, and then you sent me the quote, and I was like, okay. I heated up my coffee, and I thought to myself, like, is this going to get buried in a transcript somewhere? But sure enough, it did not. It got a lot of traction. But, but what I do want to point out though is that while this may have initially been influenced by Wall Street messaging, this. This messaging that we're discussing today has been pretty consistent from SAP since then. And uh, you all both wrote blog posts about this, which we're going to reference during this discussion. I then subsequently did an interview with board member Thomas Sauerze, and he had the opportunity to step back from those statements. But essentially, he doubled down on the things that we're discussing today. And and this was a piece that he knew was for a customer audience, not a Wall Street audience. And so where I think there is still some potential ambiguity and room for movement is to what extent does messaging become firm policy? And I still believe that SAP is going to back off a little bit from this messaging in terms of how rigid it comes off in terms of a how access is granted and stuff. But we can get into that. I don't want to get into that just yet. But I want to mention two other quick things, which is that we're probably going to be fairly critical of SAP when we get around to our opinions, but I do want to point out that SAP has done a very good job of engaging with us on this topic. And in fact, we had Josh and I were in an NDA session earlier this week. Now we know some things we can't discuss today, but the good news is that I think a lot of that's going to come out over the course of the fall. So we probably will have to do emergency podcast round two once all, all the kind of news comes out. But the, but the more important thing is we, we know enough to discuss it. And SAP has, I think, been pretty overall really generous in terms of helping us to have dialogue around the areas that we disagree on. It's just that I happen to disagree with a lot of things that they're doing right now around these policies, and we'll, I'll get into why. But but the point is they've been accessible. They've tried to clarify things. And then as these news announcements come out through the course of the fall, there's several SAP events where I, I suspect they will speak to these things, including the, the tech ed season, which we can talk about at the end. We're going to learn more. So that's where we are now. I, I agree with you, John. I mean, they've been very open. We asked a lot of questions in a, as ASUG, and they've been great in helping to clarify. So I agree with you 100%. And same here. I, I think clarification has not necessarily come with, you know, with the kind of uh, adjustment of policy that I would have liked. But there's definitely, there's definitely, and, and so whether you call it double down or just expanding on what they said, they're they're, they're holding on to these these talking points. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll I, I, I also yeah. happen to think that um, I'm I'm not going to get super animated over some of these announcements because. SAP tends to make these announcements. Customers are on a very different time horizon. And so I think we have to let some of this play through over time. It's it's like a, a good wine or, you know, something that needs some time to kind of ferment and be understood. And so, you know, I think SAP is starting to lay this out, but it might be some time before customers are actually in a position to react to this. And, you know, it's still very much in my view comes down to negotiation. And if you are going to do a deal with SAP, you're going to buy some licenses, you're going to make an upgrade. Uh, I, I believe that the customer still has a fair amount of opportunity there to have an, an ability to contractualize this in a way that makes sense, which as we've always said as ASAC, one of the most important things you can do as a customer is go into any type of agreement with SAP with eyes wide open, be perceptive and think in the future about what you need and want to make sure that gets into writing. 
Yeah, for sure. It's just that when you're when you're, for example, a partner in the partner ecosystem and SAP oh, very different, yeah. And SAP says all this is gonna be only access through Rise and you're a partner that believes in, for example, offering your customers whatever choice they want to do in terms of modernization and path to the cloud. It creates a lot of potential conflicts in your business model and how you're going to go forward. So that's why eventually messaging has to get sort of sorted in terms of what the policies truly are. And to your point, there is a backroom negotiation that can take place. And I do suspect that 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 will happen in some cases with some of SAP's biggest customers. But I would encourage SAP not to not to try to get by on that, but to try to think real hard about what user groups and what community members like Josh and I are saying around like why this this could be, I think, rethought a little bit um, and still kind of keep to the essence of what SAP is trying to do here. But we'll get back to that. I, I want to get to the other issues and lay them out because that wasn't the only thing that Christian said that, that caused a lot of discussion. He went on to talk about uh, AI innovation and pricing. He said, this is what SAP can do and where we launch further innovative AI use cases. They will come with a 30% premium because we believe in the immense value and we see how customers respond to that. And we're going to embed that in every Rise deal going forward. We will be introducing new premium Rise offerings with an uplift of up to 30% in the fall. Our approach with SAP Business AI is unmatched in the industry, delivering our customers the most relevant, reliable, and responsible AI for business. So, and and then there was uh, some further discussion around SAP's AI strategy. I picked up those topics with Thomas because there were some very interesting aspects around customers. Christian alluded to a lot of customer data as being part of SAP's advantage, which I found very interesting. Thomas, on the record in my piece, said that they, SAP has 20,000 customers that have, quote unquote, opted in to participate in in these generative AI solutions that are being developed in terms of sharing their data. And Thomas actually described in some detail, which is in my post, how that's going to work, but it has to do with a combination of SAP's foundational model, the use of external third-party LLMs from various partners, as well as a fusion of real-time data from the customer through, via a vector database. The I think the the interesting things, and obviously some of the technology will get discussed further over the course of the tech ed season, and we'll get more clarity on how all that works. But the, the I thought the very interesting thing to me was, first of all, you know, kudos to SAP for being upfront around that they got the opt-ins from their customers around this. But then also it did raise some further questions for me, which I haven't gotten answered yet. Jeff may want to speak to this. I imagine some customers still have questions around what that means because like opt-ins, sometimes what you opt into can change over time. And it doesn't mean that it's wrong or bad, but it means, hey, what exactly are you using my data for? Can we get a little bit of a refresh on that? I imagine some of those 20,000 customers would want to know a little bit more about how that's going to work, which is, you know, and I want to be clear here. I think SAP is going to do the right thing with their customers' data privacy. That's never been one of my critiques of SAP around this stuff. But I think those are going to be very interesting issues to to look into this fall. I don't know what you've heard from your members, but... Yeah, I think that uh, most members are going to, you know, really become concerned if they believe this, there's been a breach of trust as it relates to their data and their data being fed into these large language models. Now, some of it might be okay, you know, uh, the business networks tools such as Ariba or Concur, you know, which are more traditional public cloud SaaS offerings, that data getting that rolled up might actually have a lot of business value. But if I'm running a private cloud SAP ERP instance and my data is in there and SAP has somehow accessed it, which technically is virtually impossible for them to do anyway, um, I might have a very different different viewpoint. But I tend to be just a little bit more skeptical, John, about the hype around generative AI as it sits today in that we've taken a big language model called, you know, language, and you can say, you know, English or German or whatever, whatever. We've taken this language and we basically will do amazing things in these models, but it requires a tremendous amount of data. And the data has to be relevant and has to be accurate. And I think a lot of customers' SAP data is relevant and accurate today, but may not be as relevant and accurate if you go back in time. 
And if you're using, you know, time data to predict a future and your time data isn't accurate, then the predictions you're going to make are not accurate. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done with most customers. Where do most customers, when they move from ECC to S4, spend their time on data? Data cleansing, data mapping, data validation, figuring out which of this data makes sense, which of it doesn't. And you need that data in bulk to make these predictive models work as I understand them today. And I've been spending quite a bit of time on this. And so I'm just a wee bit skeptical that when we talk about ERP data, that it's really the panacea that we all, that it's being made to believe it is, that it's going to be able to do all these things that people are saying. I'm hearing a lot of, you know, potential, you know, wild, you know, futuristic statements, not a lot of concrete use cases. So just to frame this really quickly, I think what's going to be interesting about when we think about this year, we're about to head into the fall event season. Uh, Josh, I know you, you have a lovely uh, travel schedule. Jeff, I'm sure you'll be on some planes. Absolutely. And, and what this fall is going to be interesting because I think this fall is going to be all about vendors clarifying a lot of the questions that we're raising right now. But unfortunately, we're not going to hear from customers yet on what you describe, which is the customers aren't far enough along on this journey yet to be able to tell you, for example, yes, I am getting a lot of value out of this because precisely because this model is using my data and my industry, it's based on my industry, not on you know the internet <laughs> like Chad right. GPT. We're not going to get those answers this fall because customers aren't at that point yet where they can speak to it. But what I do think we can get this fall is clarity around some of the things we're describing now on did, what did I opt into? What does this mean? What are the potential use cases? How will they work? What is it going to cost me? Like these are the kinds of questions I think we're going to get, get at this fall. So John, to your point that the risk that SAP potentially has as it introduces these models and it talks about this if customers don't understand it and SCP holds steady to this notion that these are premium offerings that require a larger percentage lift in cost to purchase, it may actually cause customers to slow down and say, wait a minute, I'm going to, I'm going to step back from this for a moment until I really understand it. Cause I have to understand how I defend this to my board, how I defend this to the CEO, the CFO, the chief procurement officer, because SAP software and the systems integrators that follow with it are not minor expenses. They require a lot of sign-off. And if there's not clarity, then it's going to cause this stuff to slow down um, until very responsible executives get to clarity. And so uh, to me, I don't know how you put a value price tag on some of these innovations at the moment. And so it, for SAP to say it's going to cost 30% more, great. Am I getting 60% value from it? Am I getting 90% value? If I'm getting less than 30, I shouldn't do it. And if I can't even figure that math out, I'm going to take a pass if I was the CIO. One of, one of the, and, and I, I think, I think honestly, Jeff, I mean, you're 100% right. And I think what we're going to find in the fall is that these announcements are way out in front of reality and in front of the generally you know, available product. And, you know, this is something I posed to, to Jurgen Mueller when I saw him recently. Um, you know, can you can you truly say that those twenty thousand customers are statistically representative of the global economy, and that within those twenty thousand customers are statistically valid data models of the core business processes that you want? Uh, and you know, and because if that's twenty thousand concurrent customers, yeah, okay, so you can do a lot of time expense modeling, but you're not going to do anything about you know strategic supply chain. It's 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 a big statement. Again, I was you know what I said earlier, talking the language of Wall Street, not talking the language of the customer. And I think they're 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 on their way to building those models, or on their way to it. But we're going to get we're going to need a lot of clarity. I've been cautioning companies right and left, you know, to to not not set aside budget for this stuff. Certainly, you know, not in the near future because it's just not going to be available uh, based on what I can understand of how long it takes to to do these things. But Josh, you have to start somewhere, right? So what I do applaud is that the conversation is beginning, right? Let's have this dialogue. Let's start the innovation cycle. Let's have this back and forth. You, you know, John, you doing this emergency podcast is fantastic because it starts the conversation. It may not be where we end up, but we need to start somewhere. So I, I, you know, I've spent probably more time in the last six, eight weeks researching 
with my team, McKinsey and everyone, everything that everyone's writing, Gartner, um, you know, BCG on, on AI more than I've done in the last five months, six months. And that's, I think, part of the general journey we're on. Let's really start to understand what these use cases are, what this thing really does. And I think that's good. I think that's good news. I had to spend about five hours on blockchain to learn enough about it to dismantle it for enterprise customers. I had yeah. to spend about two hours on the metaverse. I've probably spent 500 hours on generative AI and mm -hmm. AI in general this summer. And, and I'm still not anywhere near where I want to be yet. And, and I'm taking it seriously because I think it is much more serious and, and it deserves that type of intense discussion. In terms of SAP strategy, I happen to quite like a lot of it, but I have a big problem with the pricing and, and that's a pretty serious, uh, bone of contention in the model itself. And I, I want to get back to that. But before we do that, um, I want to deal kind of sequentially here. So let's deal with rise and innovation topic and kind of finish up with that and go back to AI. So, um, another thing that, that came out that's interesting is, in that same earnings call, Christian said, we're not offering generative AI sustainability capabilities and quite different trading capabilities in our line of business and on-prem products, he said in response to an analyst question. And when a customer decides to go to a hyperscaler and get hosted with still more customizations and not align data models and do this outside of Rise, then this offering is not available. We cannot apply AI with this high quality without high data quality and that is hard to achieve in very highly customized ERP on-premise systems. And that is why AI is only available in the cloud. Now, I think the thing that I think gets very tricky for customers here is even in that quote, the notion of rise and cloud got conflated. Mm -hmm. and, the two, and, and the two issues are really very different. And I continue to object to the idea that you can only access innovation through rise at least from a technical perspective that is not correct i verified that with uh with the german user group dsag i verified it with other people there's no technical reason why you can't access these innovations i think there's a different discussion around cloud because there are some innovations that are only accessible or are much easier to access via cloud landscapes Conflating those two things is not particularly helpful for our purposes here. And what I have told SAP, and and this is what I strongly believe, is that by all means, they should make the case that RISE is the best way to consume these innovations and to manage their hyperscaler relationships. As they feel strong, SAP feels strongly about that, by all means, make the case. But I think when you combine that together, you have to be very, very careful because what you're now doing to your customers is saying, if you're not a RISE customer yet, but you're interested, say, in AI, not only do you have to buy AI now, you have to buy RISE at the same time. You have to buy into the program. And in my view, that you're you're potentially introducing friction in the in the sales process versus, for example, uh, you know there you know there's a lot of best of breed AI providers that are doing really interesting stuff that don't require you to join uh, Rise and manage your hyperscalers that way to consume AI. So I think SAP's got to be very careful about saying, oh, you have to jump through all these hoops in order to access AI because there's vendors calling on your customers every single day day that don't require you to do that and are happy to deal with your messy data and your over-customized data in order to get your account. So I think SAP needs to think really hard about that. And I would also add to that, that when you have a message around that, then the problem becomes, if if I'm thinking about making a major move to S4 HANA, and now wait, now you're telling me that I don't have access to innovation on that platform? Like, does that really help SAP in its core goal of getting more customers onto S4? I really have to wonder if that's the right messaging for that because if I were SAP, what I would want to say is, absolutely, if you're on S4, that's the future platform where you're going to be able to consume all kinds of cool stuff. you know. And yeah, there might be some value add stuff you still have to buy on top of that. But if I'm SAP, I want S4 to be sexy. And that's the thing I think they run a big risk here. Now S4 doesn't seem so sexy anymore because even if I'm on S4, I don't get access to some of this stuff. Now, as we clarified, this doesn't apply to all innovation necessarily. But I think they've made made some strategic, questionable announcements here in terms of their, their messaging. And I hope they rethink it because I don't... I, 
I just don't think it's going to work is, is how I feel. So I, this, this song goes through my mind, John, as you were saying that I'm too sexy for your landscape. I'm too sexy for yeah. your customization. I'm too sexy for, sorry, I didn't mean to do that to you. Yeah. Um, my first question, I think you're, what you're saying is amazing, but for the average customer, they, I think the first question they have to ask themselves is where do I want to be on the innovation edge? If I want to be bleeding edge innovative, and I want to be on the forefront. I want to be out leading the charge and not in the middle or the back of the pack. And there's business reasons to be in all of that. But if I want to be out front and I want to be, you know, I want to be carrying that banner, odds are if I want to be there and I want to be the first to adopt, I probably need to be on Rise. I probably need to be in public cloud. I probably need to be in as least customized system as possible because those are the requirements to get to that because that's where SAP is starting, right? If I'm saying as a customer, I'm okay. I don't want to be at the back, at the front of the pack. I'm okay being in the middle because I've got other areas in my business where I'm being more innovative and ERP may not be one of them. And there might be some really good business reasons for that. That might be okay. You might be willing to live with that. Now, you can't be in the middle of, if you say, no, I want to be in the middle of pack my ERP, but I want to be super innovative. Well, that's a little bit of a contention that you have to solve. You know, so I think for the most innovative customers, and there's a number inside of the SAP ecosystem here in North America who, who tend to lead the charge. And when you talk to them and they're leading the charge, they are just, they are doing what we're describing. They're public cloud customers who are very minimally customized because they can get to this stuff faster. And I think that's true, you know, AI or any other innovation. The more you're following a common footprint, the better the odds. If you're highly customized, messy data, lots of stuff spinning around all over the place, getting to these innovations, regardless of SAP, are hard. But, you know, Jeff, I, I mean, you're, you're 100% correct. And I think for for the and this is, again, what is innovation? What, what, what is, is innovation? Is in the mind of, of, of the customer. So if you're, I keep going back to my favorite conference of the year still, which is the Chemicals Industry Conference um, in Houston. You know, customers there, and I had some pr- interesting private conversations with them. They can't afford not to be innovative in carbon accounting. It's coming at them. Regulations are going to be there. Bang. You know, no change. Now, and this is where this, this stuff gets a little disingenuous. And John, you and I have talked about this before. I can get today's best carbon accounting software from SAP and do it running ECC. And the way I can do that, I'm going to have to, because I can't pull every instance into S4, nor do their accounting, nor do I have to. The, the infrastructure model, this is plural, that they keep putting out here, has this thing called other ERP and this other these three letters, API next to it. You can you could stand up that that public cloud, as for instance, you do the actual accounting and pull data out of all those old ECC systems until the cows come home. And in fact, a lot of companies are going to do that. And, and in fact, SAP, you know, this is where I get, I get, you know, upset about this nomenclature problem, this talking to Wall Street thing. SAP should be telling those customers, guess what? We're going to give you innovation, even though you are struggling to meet that 2027 deadline that we recognize. We're going to give you the best damn innovation possible. We, they're out there in front of sustainability, accountability. They're, they're a leader. Why do you want to cut the legs out from under these customers who need it the most, the biggest customers, the most loyal customers, by by putting by taking this incredibly complex problem they have to deal with and now giving them another incredibly complex problem called licensing? And commercial terms and conditions. Oh, you didn't go there, did you? Oh no. Um, so, <laughs> of course, one, I did. Of, one of the things that we have to remember about SAP ERP in particular, you know, is this is the lifeblood of many organizations, right? It runs their business, and therefore, it needs to be protected. It is supposed to be rock solid. It is supposed to be steady because if if you know if you have an ERP interruption in SAP. You know, I, you know, when back in my CIO days, if SAP went down, I could count in the amount of hours, about four hours before the entire operation would mm. seize up where we could not ship product. And if we couldn't ship it, we couldn't make it. If we couldn't make it, we couldn't inbound raw materials. The whole thing became almost untenable. So because of that, SAP can't go down, right? It cannot go down. And as I've said to many people, CIO's career is connected to SAP. 
the longevity of their career is tied to the stability of their SAP implementations, right? And we all know many CIOs who found themselves on the wrong side of stability to find themselves looking for some other employment opportunity. So maybe the answer to this is pieces and parts of your SAP ecosystem need to be rock solid. So if you're going to tinker with them, you better know what you're doing. And it better be rock solid. And it's not, it is not something that you say, hey, Friday afternoon, let's go do this, right? Let's see what happens. No, 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 no. So maybe the answer is parts of your, parts of your, you know, uh, your, you know, your um, infrastructure, parts of, parts of your enterprise portfolio, they look this way. Other parts are more innovative and you can play around in those pieces and parts. And so I, I think sometimes when we talk about enterprise architectures, which John, you want to get into a little bit later, look at your enterprise architecture and figure out how you want to carve this thing up. And, and there might be some potentials there. And then it changes the game. But someone who's a very heavily dependent you know, on SAP to run their business, I would not suggest being cavalier with some of these tools. Yep. Go, go experiment. But, you know, if you're going to be cavalier and, you know, you, you know, and these are big organizations running it with thousands of people, you have to do change management. You have to do training. That requires a lot of things to line up. And then there's the data problem. I mean, and then yeah, there's the data problem. Yeah, it's, 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 it's endlessly complex. And I think you're right. I think, in fact, this is the strategy. I've seen companies starting to embrace. We are going to do this piecemeal. We're going to do this in this part of the organization, not that. Um, you know, be precisely for the very reason that, you know, A, a that's a good idea. B, B, you know, there is not enough time, money, and expertise to flip every ECC into S4 between now and 2027 anyway. So you're not going to get that. Uh, Josh, so, it wasn't like people were sitting around going, you know, I'm bored. I, I don't know what to do today. I really could use something like AI to drop in my lap. I mean, most CIOs, most IT organizations who are, you know, adamant and long time, you know, fervent SAP customers have a long laundry list of things they're trying to accomplish. To your point, Josh, many of them are in the middle of S4 upgrades, rise, grow, you name it. So now AI comes along, all this innovation comes along and they're like, wait a minute, um, I, I'm, try I'm trying to get plants live. And I had a customer say that to me, he goes, you know, I, I hear you, Jeff, it makes a lot of sense, but I'm still trying to get some of my plants live on SAP. And that's more important to me than some of this other stuff. So I'm a big advocate for for the for flexible work policies and environments, but I've always said like if 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 indeed that is a better model, then you have to prove it. And and you and you can't go to a company and, and force them to do it. They they have it has to be a fit with your culture. And I'm such a big fan of of customer choice. And I understand what SAP is saying that they truly believe that in a lot of these scenarios, going through Rise is going to give a better experience for consuming some of these innovations. I, I get that. Um, where I where I struggle with is is giving the impression that customers don't have choice and don't have access to innovation oh, yeah. unless they yeah. go that route. And and in fact, to Josh's point, it's not even really fundamentally true in most cases. It might end up being true for certain things. But like, so for example, if you're an older SAP customer and you want to put in success factors tomorrow, oh, they're sure as heck going to let you do it. They're not going to make you join Rise to put that in. So, right. so, so SAP in, I would just urge people listening to this that S SAP is not, I don't think at the point yet where they're ruthlessly enforcing that as policy. It's just more talking points. But when I look into vendor architectures of what I consider cutting edge ERP in today's environment, what I see is companies that are, and I'm not going to name it, some of SAP's competitors on this call, but I see companies, what they're doing is the opposite, which is they're giving older customers as much access to, to cloud services and cloud-based innovations as they possibly can, and they're talking that way too. They're not saying you have to upgrade to get this or you have to join this to get this because they're they're 100% clear that if they don't offer those innovations and delight their customers, then some other vendor is going to come in and do it. And and the whole point is the more your loyalty to SAP translates into modern, I'm able to solve my modern business problems with SAP, the more likely they are to upgrade everything to SAP anyway. So in my mind, it's just practical. I just, I have a, I disagree with, with the current strategy is laid out. That's all it is. I disagree. There so you John, go. I, I have a thought on this and I might be being way too optimistic, but I have this sense 
if SAP is able to develop this mind altering, incredible, everyone's got to have an innovation. Every customer we talk to goes, oh my God, if I could have that, I would be so much better. And SAP realizes that the demand for this innovation is off the charts. And they do that. But you know what? 30, 40% of the customers are not on rise. Um, and would SAP basically walk away from 30, 40% of an opportunity? Or would they figure out a way right. to make it work for those environments? And, and I believe they would because it's an economic opportunity for them. And at the end of the day, you know, we started off with this being, you know, it was supposed to be an earnings call that turned into a product and pricing announcement. So if it's really an earnings call and you can optimize earnings because you can provide this innovation to customers that may not be on your ideal platform, I have this sneaky suspense and, and I don't have any better insider information than any of else do that it might just appear. Right. So. I propose for the rest of our discussion today that we take rise and grow off the table and let's also take off the table the notion that some that you have to be on public cloud to consume some things. I think it's potentially true in some cases, but let's leave that for now. And let's assume that every customer has access to AI the way it's being described because I want to get into the AI part without the distraction of the other stuff now. So we have this 30% premium. I think this is really interesting on SAP's part because part of what SAP is saying here is that they can deliver tremendous value with enterprise AI. And I don't really have a problem with, with that assertion, but, but I think it really depends a lot philosophically on your views on AI as well, because my view, and I'm, I'm open to be proven wrong here, but my view is that, is that you're not going to get tremendous value out of the box from enterprise AI. My view is that it's going to require a couple things. I think it's going to require your data and your domain experts to help train the model and co-innovate around use cases that are meaningful to your organization. And I think when you do that, I think you will be successful. And by the way, one of SAP's biggest competitors on their recent earnings call basically said what I just said. So this is not something I made up. Um, but, but I've seen some validation for this from other vendors, but, but there's a tension here between this wonderful stuff that's just going to work out of the box. And by the way, this is not just SAP that feels that way. There's a lot of deep learning enthusiasts that feel the exact same way that SAP does about this. And I think it's a very interesting juxtaposition. And I'm not saying hundred percent that I know that I'm right. I just, this is just my position. I believe it's going to require close customer co-innovation and experimentation oh, with different yeah. scenarios. And as a result of that, I highly question whether the 30% pricing kick is realistic at this point, because my view is if I'm going to collaborate with you, provide my domain experts to help train your model and by the way, provide my data for that model. And wait, now you're going to charge me a 30% premium for that. I don't, to me, that's not workable. But if I'm wrong and this stuff pretty much delivers incredible value right out of the box, then I think you can certainly charge 30% premium for that. So I think this one is interesting because it's a little bit different than the rise one because that's more like a policy thing that I totally disagree with. This is more of a, of a open debate on the value of AI in the enterprise, how it's going to be discovered and achieved. And I don't think anyone has a definitive correct answer on that because we don't know, but that's just what I think. I think, John, it comes back to business case, right? If I can sit down and determine that this piece of functionality, AI, is going to create $10 million of value for my organization, and I can pay a million dollars to achieve that 10, I should do it. I should absolutely do it, right? Um, if you tell me that I, I don't know how much business value I'm going to get from it, but it's going to cost me $10 million and I might get a million from it, I probably shouldn't do it. Now, where I think this is going to be interesting in the short term is I think there's going to be, and my hunch is, there's going to be a whole lot of R&D projects that go on, that go nowhere and spend a lot of money and deliver suboptimal results because we just don't know. I happen to be watching, to your point, very, very carefully the hyperscalers talk about this. And from a hyperscaler point of view, it's all AI all the time. 
AI, AI, and why? Because basically you have to rent their server capacity to do it. So whether you're doing pilots or you know proof of concepts, they're making their dollars on that. They're not accountable for the outcome. Right. Yeah, yeah. The infrastructure providers, you have to put them to the side because they're going to make money regardless. So that doesn't right. really help us. But ultimately, it's the it's the population, the customers you and I are talking to today and the partners that support them that ultimately have to take that and turn it into some sort of tangible business case driven thing that they can put a price tag against it. Otherwise, the CFO is not going to be very interested. What do you I think, think Josh? Well, I, th- I you know, again. Christian's talking in the language of Wall Street. We're going to charge yep. more money. No customer wants to know two things. One, that we're going to we're going to make you pay independent of whether we show you the value. And B, and I think this was implicit in some of this, and we're going to, we're going to sort of leave you to sweat the asset you got right now because that's not really growing in value anymore. You know, customers always want to know that your investment is going to be worth more and we're mm-hmm. going to make it worth more. And that we're going to do these incredible things for you, and they're going to be so incredible, you're going to love them independent of the price, because that's part of what's going to be incredible. All Christian had to do is use some language like that. We have innovation coming to Wall Street. This innovation is going to really be blow customers' minds. It's going to do incredible things. We're going to get to charge more for it, maybe even 30% more, but we're going to demonstrate its value to the customer incontrovertibly. They'll be paying for it. Not because we're holding a gun to their head, but because they're coming to us saying, "Please let me do that." It's I'm going to get I'm going to get ten cents on the dollar. You know, ten. <laughs> I'm sorry, ten dollars on the penny for that. Yeah, let's do it. You should do it. I, 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 I have the um I have the pleasure of moving from being a CIO to being a CEO, right? And my seat now is very different. And when my technology team, and by the way, I have great ideas of how we as ASUG can put. AI to use. And it's funny. I, I, in some ways, I play the traditional CEO card. And I'm like, we can do this. We can do that. We'll do this, that, 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 that. And you know, I'm all ex- in, in, animated. And my tech team is like, okay, just dial that down a little bit, Jeff, and let's have some pragmatic conversation. But here's what's going to happen. At some point in time, they're going to come back to me and say, hey, we do want to do some of this. And I'm going to say, okay, how much is it going to cost? I say, it's going to cost X. I say, what's the business value? Uh, I don't know. Well, if you say, I don't know, I'm probably not going to approve it. Right. So at some point in time, I do believe the, the 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 pieces and the mechanisms are here to make sure that when these things happen, we actually because it, it's it, you know, some CEOs will buy in. They'll take a risk, they'll take a gamble, but once bitten, twice shy. Right. Uh, I'll give you some money to play. But if you can't deliver business results, and that's where I'm actually across the whole AI spectrum, I'm very curious to see when does hype and reality meet. Because there's a lot of hype right now. And I, I guess I'm just a little skeptical about what Good. this really comes down to. So so a few, a few things I want to clarify real quick. One, one, Josh, I understand your point around Wall Street messaging. But I, I do want to be clear that since that time, that messaging has been repeated in, in non-earnings call context. Yeah. So I, I wish I could just go with you and say, yeah, that's more what Wall Street wants to hear, but actually that's been repeated many times, including interviews, analyst briefings. So right now SAP is sticking with that 30% um, premium messaging around AI. Now, having said that, SAP is not the only vendor that's doing stuff like this. Microsoft sure. Microsoft announced a pricing plan, not unlike that for uh, some of its built-in digital assistant offerings and stuff like that. Um, so, But my view is that this is premature to talk about charging for this for the reasons 100%. I described. Now, I do think there are a couple of so-called low-hanging fruit use cases where there may be some out-of-the-box thing, but the problem is that the kind of things I'm being shown by SAP and other vendors are often not that. So, for example, like just about every vendor, including SAP, is showing off some version of you know, HCM job description stuff, job description creators. Sorry, but I don't see millions of dollars of value in that. I think it's a cool use case. And um, and I think there's a lot of good stuff around digital assistance for HR, but sorry, I don't see millions of dollars in value there. What one thing though I do see is, and there, and I was trying to call up this study, but on this computer, um, my Adobe Acrobat reader isn't you, working. You need um, AI. But yeah, yeah. But it's a study that was done on generative AI at work that I just sent you, Jeff. Actually, but basically, it was looking at 
uh, the so-called digital assistant scenario for service reps. And it, it's a comprehensive study that was done on the value that was delivered. And what they found was that there was this productivity increase for junior level service reps, because essentially the generative AI codified the senior level service reps knowledge and provided it to these junior level assistants. I think that's a very low hanging fruit type of use case. Um, it doesn't have to be nearly a hundred percent accurate to be helpful. And uh, as long as it's pretty accurate and, uh, and, and job performance went up, uh, customer satisfaction went up, retention went up, but not by extreme amounts. It was something in the 15 to 30%? 20. Was it 30%? It was 15 to 20. <laughs> it wasn't our 30% pricing. So there's some examples that have been documented, but I think what we're going to find is when you, when you go past that, those, those quote unquote easier ones, what you're going to find is it's much tougher sledding and very company specific. And when you get into complex supply chain requirements and stuff like that, these are not easy things because the data is all over the place in medical stuff. You have all these data records that are either unstructured or under all kinds of regulatory red tape. These are not easy scenarios to sort through. And that's why I'm a little concerned about SAP's mentality around, Oh, we're going to have all this tremendous value out of the box. I'll be delighted if SAP can prove me wrong. I'm and I'm being consistent on this. I, I I feel this way about every single vendor that's trying to charge for this stuff for the most part. But the one thing I do want to say is like everything else about SAP's AI stuff I really like. So I do want to say that because SAP's done a great job on things like explainability, ethics, data privacy. They, they have integrated a lot of their ethics into how they develop AI. They've taken certain um, AI use cases off the table that that disagree with their eth ethical stances. And I think overall, their approach to describing AI is, I think, very solid. And so I do want to give them a lot of credit for that because I've been kind of hammering them on the price thing. But I think the other pieces of the messaging really work, which is partially why I'm disappointed in the price part, because <laughs> I like the rest of the messaging quite a bit. I think they're hitting all the right notes, and I think they're, they're taking it all very seriously. I, I would question whether you can actually like remove bias from AI in, in, in an easy type of way, but, but I like all the messaging. So there is a, a virtual event coming up on September the 26th, um, Rise into the Future. And this is uh, an event that SAP is sponsoring. Uh, it is on at 11 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Standard Time, 5 o'clock p.m. Uh, Central European Time. And it's supposed to be where they're going to start to get into some of these innovations and what some of this means and how do you think about it. And so what is really cool is I will happen to be in Waldorf on September the 26th. And I will be there with four fellow ASA board members, and we're going to turn it into a watch party. And I'm very, uh, I'm very interested and I'm excited to have all of us around the table at the same time hearing these messages as SAP is announcing them and hearing real-time feedback from fellow customers about how they interpret it. And let, let's see what SAP has to say. I'm very optimistic. I appreciate that we're moving this ball forward. Let's go talk about how do we make some of this stuff really work. Um, I don't think it's going to be perfect, but I'm glad we're on the journey. And there's going to be a number of events this fall that Josh, Josh, you're going to as many SAP events as anyone I know. So where are you going to be picking this up this fall? Well, in terms of the event, well, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm excited uh, to see what they're going to talk about at Spend Connect. So that's the, you know, the, the yep. <clears throat> ISBN business unit that's going to be in Vienna, um, which is a nice place to go. But more importantly, nice. you know, that's the organization spend you know they own spend spend is a great place to use uh, ai we've been using it for years you know we do already do invoice reconciliation we only do a, real, a lot of really smart things and in fact i think you know you could potentially build a large language model about an industry you know telecommunications bill processing take that data really crank some you know, some modeling on that and, and offer as a, you know, offer something that could potentially have a 30% premium without even using individual company data. There's potential there, but I'm, I'm really looking for that. I actually, the week before I'll be at Success Connect, so that's, you know, that's, that, that's the, the big tease so far has been this, you know, this job creation, um, um, you know, uh, job description creation uh offering that uses chat GPT. I'll, I'll have to say, I have to admit, I think it's, not a high value 
proposition at all, but it has a lot of it has a lot of resonance in the AI community. People hate doing that job, um, and they'd much yeah. rather point a you know a chat GPT at it and let it crank something out and then you know tweak the edges and let it run. So so I I, I think that's a place where if all they do is show us another way in which you can generate a job description, I'm going to be, um, you know, my head's going to drop on my chest. I I suspect we'll see more than that just because what I think we're going to see this fall is we're going to see the emergence of so-called digital assistants that work within a specific context only. Like, so it's not a digital assistant that serves all of your needs throughout the workday, right? Like, Oh, look up this, file this leave request, uh, schedule a meeting for next week. It's not going to be that kind of thing. It's going to be much more focused on a specific area. So I suspect, and I, I haven't been brief, so I don't know, but I suspect that at Success Connect, we'll hear more than just job descriptions. It'll be more about helping those busy HR managers, to your point, Josh, with all kinds of stuff that's bogging them down so they can be more strategic about talent. And you know, some of that is potentially really cool. So, but the so. real event to get into this, gentlemen, the real event right. is SAP Tech Ed and ASUG Tech Connect in New Orleans, 7, 8th, and 9th of November. And Jurgen will be keynoting uh, on the first day of ASUG Tech Connect on November 7th, Tuesday. So we'll be inviting him on stage. And I can't think of a better place to, to actually get into some of this conversation than with Jurgen. And Jurgen and I are going to kick it off together. And he's got a special guest coming in as well. So I think that's a fantastic place to really, if you're an SAP customer and you want to understand where AI is going, I can't think of a better place to also potentially, you know, talk with fellow customers, fellow ASUG members, and really understand where everyone's head is at. That was a shameless self-promotion and I apologize. Well, you made it 50 <laughs> minutes without a shameless plug. That's that's pretty good. Wow. Wow. Um, and and I do I do want to mention that uh, if Jurgen's not enough of a draw, I think Josh and I will be doing some kind of a session there too. You know, I so, I know you're both going to be there, but I was worried that you'd I don't mind in the process, and I was going to stay there. So I'm not going, Jeff. I don't mind being on the undercard to Jurgen in in that regard. But anyway, no, I want to if, talk to both of you as well. Maybe we if, could do this as a live podcast. Yeah, if that's not enough, um, in the interest of fairness, I I want to I want to read something Bob Evans wrote he about this. He said, will some bulk at the 30% premium for AI? No question. Will those bulkers remain competitive? I would say that's a huge question. He said, I applaud Klein for making this decision because it is based not on SAP's internal cost structure, but rather on how customers perceive value, innovation, and risk, particularly the risk of standing still in a world where the future is coming at us faster than ever before. That's Bob Evans. He knows this market pretty well. I profoundly disagree with almost every single word of that statement, but I think it's important to be able to, to, to show that, that, that not everyone agrees with, with the takes that we're sharing today. So I, I, again, if, if you, if you're going to get a hundred dollars of innovation that you can recognize and you're going to spend $30 for it, go do it. Go do it. And if that's what Bob is suggesting, he's absolutely right. But I wonder if you could really as a customer and if SAP says the customers get $100 of innovation, why not charge them $50? Why not charge them $60? So I don't know where the 30 comes from. I think it's incredibly premature. I don't know. Yeah, uh, it is premature. That, but, but, um, or Christian has <laughs> Christian sitting on a landmine of opportunity that we're going to hear about on the 26th of September and the three of us together minds are going to go poof. I'm looking forward to that. The poof. I don't know. Um, I don't know. Blow my mind. Yeah. I hope so. I, I, it's possible. It's possible. Um, yeah. And I think, I think though, you know, again, you know, I always, you know, every time I have this conversation with a customer about what should we do, we be doing about chat GPT, what should, you know, should we be investing? I always ask, how, how, how's that spreadsheet? thing going with you guys you know how how is your digital supply chain looking um i down i downloaded on my windows my windows desktop which i run on my mac the new windows 11 copilot i i haven't used it i haven't figured out i mean it sits there on the side in the sidebar and it's waiting for me to do something but i actually i haven't done anything with it yet and and i got to figure out what i want to do with it well is that an example i mean i don't know yeah I mean the cart before the horse. Um, the, the, are you going to pay? Are you going to pay thirty percent for that, Jeff? 
Yeah. Right now it's what? free. It's right now it's free, John. So I, I okay. don't. You know, I, I asked it one All thing. Right. I said change my display resolution to a hundred percent because I think it for some reason on my Mac it defaults to one hundred seventy five. And it seemed like the I, it, this is I mean, exactly what you said about digital assistant. And I thought it was going to do it for me. If I could say screen resolution one hundred seventy five, and it go gotcha done, I would have been right. yes. You know what it did? It said here's how you do it, and it gave me a PDF. Di- it re- referenced me to a web window, a website that told me how to do it. I already knew how to do it. I was hoping something could do it faster, and it didn't do and, that. And we've already been getting that kind of help from Siri, you know. We, we, and it's not as helpful as we would like. Um, yeah. You know, and and you know, I think a lot. The other thing to remember is, you know, a lot of this stuff. Why we're so yeah, it, the hype. The hype has its own momentum and its own kind of. You know, it's sort of fueling itself. We've been dealing with hallucination from AI for for ages. I mean, that's what that's what all these GPS uh, stories are about. People driving off of you know off of bridges. I was just navigating downtown San Francisco in rush hour and ways. You didn't drive off a bridge, did you, Josh? No, I didn't. But it literally was plotting me in this circle. I was supposed to do this sort of five you know five block circle and then get back on the freeway. I threw it out, turned it back on, and the hallucination was over. How many times have we all done that this week? You know, so so why we're sort of believing this <laughs> to be so such a beautiful future when we've been dealing with 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 AI forever and it's been messy. Look at all the car, you know, the self driving cars that run off the road and run down people, um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's 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 hard to do this stuff and it's not going to happen overnight. And I have. I have a, a lot of that. My house is pretty highly automated. It's a geeky thing for me. And Alexa is part of that geek factor. So you can say to Alexa in our house, you know, and she'll turn on most of the lights are off in the house. There is a evening ritual between my wife and I am trying to get the lights off in our master bedroom that requires a very special way to say it to her. And sometimes she ignores it. Sometimes she turns them on, not off. Sometimes you have to use the word light, not the word lights. And so back to your point, Josh, you know, can't you just do what I'm sort of suggesting? Turn turn the bedroom lights off, and it's 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 four or five attempts, and you're just like, why am I doing this? Indeed. So I want to bring us back on topic, and then we're going to wrap. Reed. I want to. I, I I gotta do a little bit of the like, yeah, res- slight man. respect for our listeners who are still hanging in there. If they're still here after an hour, I want to give them a little more juice. Um, just real quick, I know Jeff, you you all have done a lot of interesting collaborations with the German user group DSAG. Um, and uh, obviously they have strong feelings about this. I just wanted to just quickly send along a couple, a uh, couple notes that I, that I got from Jan's. I can't pronounce his last name. Sorry. Uh, chairman. Great. Yep. Uh, I'll see him next but, week in, in Bremen. But um, he, he sent me a couple notes by email. Uh, he talked about how in the future though, cause the German user group has a reputation for being kind of anti-cloud. And he said in the future, there'll be more and more innovations based on cloud technology. That is right and important. DSAG is concerned with making these innovations available to SAP on-premise customers as well. He mentioned how the 30% premium for AI is something that they're going to want to have a lot of dialogue with SAP and they're having talks now. And then he says, in principle, they support the use of cloud technology and see huge opportunities, but the members claim they can also use these functionalities with their S4 HANA on-premise systems. And the reason I wanted to mention that is just because last fall, there was a pretty significant moment where it was kind of agreed with SAP that on-premise customers would have access to the same quote unquote innovation that cloud customers would. And so that's where the tension points are arising for the German user group because they felt they extracted an agreement with SAP last year. So now they're upset. And look, I understand that. And I, but at the same time, I also think that the most important thing is not that people get upset. It's that the dialogue happens. And so what I'm hopeful about is that along with ASUG and along with SAP, the, the user groups, around the world will have this dialogue and come to a good understanding because I don't think anyone wants to linger in the past and dig in their heels. They just want to look out for their customers who have invested in what they feel is a loyal relationship and they want to succeed together. And, and I, it, the solutions to that may be beyond anything we've suggested in this podcast, but I think that dialogue is what is going to create them. John, you pronounce his last name as follows Hungerhausen. Thank you. 
I should have practiced it before the taping, it, but I was too busy gathering blog posts. It's it's the value I bring today too. Thank this, you. And, and by the way, DSAG and ASUG, we talk all the time. Uh, we have very different beliefs on how to go about advocating on behalf of our members. Um, but at the end of the day, Jens, his team, my team, we, we talk all the time. We collaborate. We exchange viewpoints. And we're not very far off each other. We just choose to do it in different ways. I think I want to I want to just focus on one thing in that DSEG sta- statement, which I think is is again part of the problem. I'm, I guess I'm in a language mode today. <laughs> SAP's done something actually I think is remarkable and very customer positive, which has given customers a tremendous amount of choice, more choice than any other vendor. You can run you know you can run as for Hana on premise. You can run it on premise as a managed cloud. You can run it. Private cloud, you can do all these different versions of S for HANA. You can have all these different versions of hybrid. You can really do this mix maxing. And the problem is then, 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 unfortunately, these statements come out that are talking, we're only going to give it to you in cloud. Well, from whose cloud? What cloud? Mm-hmm. Only, you know, is, is S for HANA private cloud? Is that running on premise in my data center? Is that a cloud? Or is yeah. that an on premise? What are we talking about here? It becomes a huge nomenclature problem, and 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 everyone gets tripped up on this. I, I mean, I've been I've been down this road a hundred times with SAP to clarify what do you mean when you say on yeah. yeah. and what do you mean when you say cloud? What do you mean you say S four? And 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 they still are inconsistent internally. They're still inconsistent externally. We turn around and make the same mistakes. Your DSEC st- statement ex- exemplified that. They, you know, S for HANA is an on-premise system for some of these customers. So is ECC. Which one are we talking about when we say on-premise? This stuff is really messy, and it's messy because nomenclature gets in the way, and because SAP, instead of putting out in front and being proud of the fact that they do more for customer choice, in the, in particular existing customer choice than anybody, they they scramble to be to, be, to, to sort of hide behind the perception of orthodoxy. We're cloud. We're pure cloud. We're not, and 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 Wall Street, you know, I'm being up on Wall Street again. So it's great because everyone should be just like Salesforce and Workday. Um, it, Cloud company like, hire multiple. Well, that that I'm going to allow you to blame on Wall Street because yes. because the cloud the cloud obscurity around instances and deployments is largely caused by Wall Street expectations, and it's not only SAP that struggles with that. Any right. any cloudy any so-called cloud ERP vendor that has some kind of on-prem install base and hosted options has the yep. exact same problem. And 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 it, it creates a lot of unnecessary confusion that could be solved by simply saying if it's if it's not public cloud, it's on prem. <laughs> and just keep it simple. But I'm unfortunately it SAS, John. Yeah, or we could call it SAS. Anyhow, um Josh. But, but this is but but John to your point and and Josh to your point. I don't, I'm not going to be an SAP a pass here because I 100% agree with you. These are very complex landscapes that most customers run. It's very complex what we're talking about. And it's very difficult to describe in, in a few words. And that's, I think, where this whole thing gets kind of mushed up is that, you know, even when I try to write some of these things, I find myself in excruciatingly awkward positions and in pain trying to keep it as simple as it is, as it can be when these are very complex processes. You know, and, and it just makes me think too with SAP where like, like Josh in our NDA briefing that we had earlier this week, we can't obviously talk about it, <laughs> but I will say this, which is I started out kind of really disagreeing with a lot of the stuff I was hearing because for the reason we talked about, and then towards the end, uh, we had about 10 or 15 minutes of really open dialogue as a group, analysts and SAP. And I was like, this is the best damnedest online discussion I've had in like two or three months at least with a vendor. And it was all part of the same call. And it was such an interesting reminder of the fascinating contradictions in this particular company where you can hear these messaging things that are so off-putting, but then when they really step up to the plate and have the kind of dialogue that they know that they're that they're capable of yeah. you, you have this tremendous discussion and you leave feeling energized and the, and that this is an exceptional company. So I would urge SAP to err on that side because it was such a contrast. I don't know, Josh, if you experienced the same thing, oh. but 
But I was so struck by how that tone shifted at the end. And, and this is SAP's problem, is that they are unique. They are the only company in our industry that has an ASA, that has a DSAC, that plays mm-hmm. this active role. They're the only company in our industry that has had these, this, this community sense of, 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 of listening and, and conversing and dialoguing. And there's, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, who would like that to go away. And there's a lot of way in which messaging is being sort of compacted into a, you know, into something I can sell with a click and a, and a credit card. But at the end of the day, the, 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 the customer base, particularly the membership base of ASOG and DSAG, but, and the, and the, is, is dealing with exactly the complexity Jeff talked about. And to be able to have a complex dialogue with your, it, it's so hugely important. It's it's a it's a blessing and a curse. You're going to be held to a different standard. And SAP is, and we know Christian and the board are constantly going. Why don't they pick? Why don't they pick on someone else? <laughs> mm. Because they're all doing the same things. When 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 indirect licensing was coming up, SAP got hammered for it, and and every other company is doing the same or worse. Mm. Granted, that's a problem. But the flip side of it is exactly why we're here today. We're here not to you know when I. Not get a berry season. We're here to, we're here to make the customer successful, and yeah. we, that means SAP needs to be successful. We're just trying to help <laughs> steer right. that ship a little bit more in the right direction. Because at the end of the day, that's what needs to happen, and the customers are really looking forward to SAP and us, you know, working together to make that happen. It's not like I- any other. 100% agree with you, Josh. I view as one of the most important things I can do as the chief community champion and CEO of ASUG is to make sure that SAP is as relevant 50 years from now as it has been in its past 50 years. Because customers are making a long-term bet that this software will run their enterprises for the long term because it's very complex. It's very expensive. It does a tremendous number of things. And so we have to work alongside SAP as customers to make sure that this software is here for the long duration because nothing would be more disrupting to most of these customers than finding out that the software they're picking to run their enterprise isn't going to make it past the next 5, 10, 15 years. So this is a long-term play. And most customers, the board of ASUG, 12 CIOs that uh, govern this community here in North America are adamant on this point that our job is to make sure that we are protecting their investment over the long term. Not, not every quarter. Not every quarter. Indeed. All right. We've totally overstayed our welcome, but let's just quickly cover lean IX because it was acquired. It was a pretty big acquisition, probably about the scale of Signavio. Um, I, I do have a statement from SAP on this that was provided to, uh, Mark Chillingworth, who's a UK-based Digenomica contributor who's currently working on a piece on this, SAP, to explain the acquisition, said, we plan to create a comprehensive business transformation suite that will encompass the functionality they need for ongoing business transformation, allowing them to navigate change more easily. The unique combination of Lean IX's IT landscape transformation capabilities with SAP Signavio process transformation suite along with other solutions of the SAP portfolio, such as cloud, ALM, and BTP, will give our customers the ability to create a culture of ongoing adaptability and improvement. Josh, reactions. Um, you know, and, and, and I, I, I think that what they are offering when you start in combining LeanIX with Signavio, with cloud, ALM, with some of these, these infrastructure tools, uh, in this combination of infrastructure and business process together, it's 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 huge. It's hugely unique. It's it's a it's a game changing um, uh, uh, opportunity when you add data sphere and the idea that you know as we've talked about, data needs to be cleaned up. Plus, we have technical debt, data debt, process debt, infrastructure debt. Let's attack this with with the very best tools. That's great. The change management side of that is, oh boy, you know we got to really figure out how to how to absorb all this and think this way. Um, I, I've been to a, a Lean IX event recently. They're smart. They're good. They, they can draw a crowd. The enterprise architects love this stuff. Uh, they need to have a stronger message for the business user and the influencer. Um, that's not impossible, but that needs to happen because this has got to be sold. It's you know it's it's a good idea, but you got to just because it's a good idea doesn't mean someone's going to take it over. So I, I think it's a, I think it was a good acquisition. I think it was. Um, a, a good idea and now they kind of make it all work together 
Jeff, explain the acquisition. <laughs> I think <laughs> pass. Um, the enterprise architect is one of the most important roles in a technology organization, right? It's the person who has to figure out how to fit all these puzzle pieces together. I don't think the puzzle is getting easier to solve. I think it's progressively getting harder. Everything we've talked about today, cloud, AI, these are not things that simplify an enterprise landscape. They complexify it. The enterprise architect is at the intersection of all those things. If this is a piece of software that helps make their job easier, helps them do their job better, then congratulations, every customer should have it in their in, in their portfolio, and we should applaud the the enterprise architect. I mean, SAP earlier this year at Sapphire came out with an enterprise architect certification program. I think that is phenomenal. I think this is the next step in doing that. So if Signavio, if this is to Signavio, you know, if, if Lean IX is, is the enterprise architect version of Signavio, go do. I just want to make one quick add to this, which is, <laughs> I don't disagree with anything the two of you have said. Um, I would say I think it's also useful to understand this acquisition in the context of SAP's ongoing attempts to position itself as the best value against what the hyperscalers have to offer, and particularly around Rise. So I would expect a fair amount of, of forward roadmap that will kind of make that clear as to how that fits into how SAP can provide a different experience for its customers in terms of managing their landscapes. That's really important to SAP. But I would also urge SAP that what they just described in that statement sounds really cool, but I suspect will take a long time. In the meantime, we heard from uh, at the ASUG annual conference, Josh, we heard from customers that want help now automating S4 HANA migrations. And I would urge SAP to not lose track of that shorter term goal because in the in the short term, they want more tooling around that than they currently have. And whether that's you, SAP, or whether that's partners, customers want more tooling and more understanding of what tools are available. I know Jurgen is poignantly aware of this, so it will be interesting to see if we see some virtual tech ed announcements or, or even at ASUG Tech Connect around this. And of course, Jeff, now you guys have to change your program to incorporate this. So that's a lot of fun for your event team as well. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm sure they were totally thrilled uh -huh. to read those press releases. Our Good. content needs to shift again. Yeah. Yep. All right, guys. I think we should wrap. Good but we might, we might do this again later this fall. I hope you all enjoyed this. And yeah. thanks, guys. Thank you, John. Yep. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You, later. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Josh. Bye.